And we are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, here with Sarah. Hello. And we are going to paint a four color uh, kind of fall scene in watercolor. This is a beginner friendly um, tutorial. If you have any questions as we go along, type the word question in all caps, and um, then either one of the moderators will help you, or Sarah will relay the question to me if it's something that, um, that the moderators can't, um, can't answer. So uh, what we're going to use is four colors. We're going to use a vermilion, which is a, any warm red. Cad red is fine. Permanent yellow deep, so a warm yellow. You could also use gamboge, Indian yellow, um, any sort of warm yellow. Uh, permanent lemon blue. And these all came from the Holden set of 32. Uh, I'm sorry, Holden set of 18. I believe it's $34 on Amazon. I did link it down below because I think it's a nice, uh, a nice deal to try this line of paint. And... Um, and we're just going to work on a piece of rough watercolor paper, but you can use cold press. It really does not matter. I've just really enjoyed using rough last week, so I thought I would uh, do it again this week. So what I'd like you to do is make a horizon line on your paper, about a third of the way down from the top, really, really light. Like, you can hardly see that. If I tip it, I think you can see it a little bit better. I'll make it a little darker for you. You really don't need it very dark uh, because we're going to be painting over that. But that's where kind of the land and sky would meet, except we have some mountains back here. So I'm just going to go in and sketch uh, like a couple mountains. And we have this little, this is kind of a marshy area. So we have a little bit of water kind of poking through here. Got a little bit of land here. I do have a reference photo linked up in the video description for you to check out. If you want to have that open while we are... Um, Sketching along. I guess I need to make this a little bit darker. It's, it's probably hard for you to see. Don't sketch it too dark at home. Um, I'm sketching it darker than I would just so that you can see it. And I think my whites look really bright. I'm downstairs in the studio instead of upstairs in the office, so um, the lighting's probably a little bit brighter down here as well. And we're also going to have a few little trees kind of in the foreground. I'm just get to sketching a few branches. So when we do like our mountains, I'm just going to be making a little indication that we want to save some of this area light so that we'll be able to put some uh, trees and bushes and stuff in here. Okay. I'm using Princeton Neptune brushes today, uh, as well as the Creative Mark Mimics. Um, and these, if you don't have a Jerry Jotorama nearby, you can get these at pretty much any, like you can, I, I got some of these at Michael's. I've got them um, on Amazon. You can pretty much get them at any. You can get them at Jerry's. You can get them um, pretty much anywhere. I'm going to wet the top half of the paper right down to the horizon line. And then I'm going to grab a little Prussian blue. Really watery. I'll show you my palette. This palette is actually a... Um, a cheap palette. It came with paint in it, but I didn't like the paint, so I took the paint out and filled it with my whole line. But this is a really sturdy, thick plastic palette. I did link that below because I figured somebody will ask me about it. And Prussian blue at the top, and then kind of tip my paper and just let it kind of wick down because I don't want a really strong, strong color there. And then I'm also going to grab some of this color and throw it into my little water area. I'm using a number 16 round here. And our water is reflecting our sky. It's really still water. And so I want to also put some um, colors for the grasses that would be around on the edges. So for that, I'm actually going to switch to a number 8 round. I'm going to mix um, permanent yellow deep and some of that Prussian blue. And that's going to give me pretty much like a sap green color. And that's going to go in right along the edges. So we'll have a soft reflection. Nice to do this while the water is wet so you don't end up with, um, with any uh, harsh puddles or lines. Oh, there's one color I forgot to list, actually. Burnt Sienna. 
um, I don't know how I forgot that, but we will be using some burnt sand. I just remembered that because I'm going to be grabbing it for in here in just a second. I didn't bother taping my paper down, but it probably would be a good idea uh, if you want to make sure it doesn't wrinkle or just kind of it will bow a little bit while you're working like mine is, but not a not a big deal. I'm going to grab a little burnt sienna, though. And I'm going to add a little bit just to these edges here. Dried grasses. And I want to make sure I have a little bit of that showing in the water as well. Okay, and now for the mountains, we're going to work on the mountains. The paper is probably still a little damp, and that's good because we want it kind of far away and fuzzy. Working on a nonstick mat, so my, my paper wants to slide around. I apologize. It might uh, move a little bit. Did you have a question, Sarah? Yes. Sorry, I scrolled up. I, you were, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, Ian Jackson, do you like mechanical pencils, clutch pencils, or traditional wood pencils for drawing watercolor? Honestly, I like mechanical pencils, and um, the one I really like is a Pentel uh, that takes a 0.07 millimeter lead. I've also found some decent ones at the Dollar Tree that side, side advance, but this is my absolute favorite. This is a real old one, but they still make this. This is P207 on it. I don't know if that's what the new ones are called, but um, the new ones don't feel quite as heavy, but they're they're still pretty good. Uh, for the mountains, I am going to use a uh, mixture. I'm going to use the Prussian blue. I'm also going to use a mixture of Prussian blue and um, permanent yellow deep and also Prussian blue and lemon, just so I have some different colors for some green trees. And I might pick some other colors up too, but i got to keep it kind of cool in the background or it will um, want to come forward. And I'm going to start with a more blue mix at the top. And you can see the paint wants to fuzz a little bit because it is um, it is still wet. The paper is still wet, but that's what we want. So you'll notice when I paint this in, I'm not going to fill in this whole mountain area because I know I'm going to have trees, ground that I want to reserve space for. So that's why I am not painting it all the way. Catherine Lecture Corin, how would you compare the Princeton Neptune brushes to the Creative Mimic? They're almost identical, honestly, in performance. Um, the Mimics are a little bit less expensive if you have access to a Jerry's Artorama. Um, if you don't have access to a Jerry's Artorama, then um, then the Neptunes would probably be a better a better deal. So I know these are available worldwide, whereas the um, Mimics are are just available in the USA, I think. So. I would call I would consider them equal in quality. Just it just depends on what you're what you have available to you. I think I'm gonna grab a little bit of that uh, burnt sienna in there too. And I'm just getting texture by tapping it in. Uh, Leah G, my M gram paints in my palette have little brown speckles in it. My other pigments don't. What is wrong with it? Hmm. I have no idea. I've never had that issue with my M-Gram paints. You might have got some mold introduced to them, but it wouldn't be like a by brand thing, so hmm, I'm not sure on that one. Okay, so now I'm going to work on um, some of the kind of grassy areas, and I'm going to grab some lemon into that uh, Prussian blue. I think I'm gonna switch to my bigger brush too because I have a quite a quite a bit of area to cover. I'm gonna grab my lemon. I'll just scoot over my palette so you can see what, what it looks like here. Put some lemon in there. Grab some Prussian blue. Put in a little more lemon than that. And I'm gonna grab a little bit of vermilion, which is a warm red. Just pull it up to the side because I think I'm going to need some of that as well. But I don't want it mixing in with the green and making it all brown. Logan Kinnison, how do you protect or store your brushes when traveling? Um, I have special brushes I bring traveling that are um, 
that are shorter and they fit right in my palette. So that's what I do. I don't bring my my uh, at home brushes uh, traveling. All right. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of base it in with this kind of lemony uh, green. It's like a well, it's almost like a lime green, I guess. Get that in there first. Instead of wetting the paper with water, I'm wetting it in. I'm wetting it with this. Harry Cuddlepuss, how can you tell if your watercolors are moldy? They would look. Uh, they'd have that you know white mildewy fuzz on it, um, or they would have some green mold on it. It's pretty obvious. I'm adding some of the vermilion in there, and you can see we're getting some kind of rich neutrals when we do this. And I'm going to go in with some uh, permanent yellow deep. And I always tap it on my, uh, what I'm doing, it's off camera, but I'm just tapping my brush on my palette so I don't get any big globs or too much water. And we'll bring around some of this color over here. I like to let it mix on the paper because it just gives me a more lively, uh, lively look. And then with the red. And this is just our background, so don't uh, don't stress out over any of this. Let's have a little bit of grass in there. You can even pull this color up as high as a horizon line, but you will be covering over some of that. So just keep that in mind. These brushes hold a lot of water, so sometimes you can get way more on your paper than you intend to. So then just you know rinse and wipe your brush off and you can go in and uh, fix whatever you need to. This brush is fairly dry, I can drag up little grasses here. I don't want to do too much because I might want to darken some of that water. I can bring up a little bit right there. Okay, so I'm going to dry this. If anybody has any questions at this point, you can go ahead and pop them in the chat. We'll get to the moment. You're talking about uh, Bonnie in her large pregnancy state, being Princess Leia. Oh. Princess <laughs> Leia. Oh. Is it better to do it with watercolor pencils, markers, or just the brushes? So, I don't know what it is. What is it? The picture, light, another picture, card. Generally, with watercolor pencils, I would go with like the size of the painting you're trying to do. If you're doing some ball, coloring with a pencil, and then just wetting it with a brush works pretty well. Uh, once you get like this size, you probably would be better off like lifting up the pigment from the pencil with a brush. Otherwise, it could be kind of tedious. I'm assuming that's what you meant to ask. There, that's like pretty quick. Okay, so now we're going to go to a smaller brush. I'm using the number eight round. This again is also a Princeton Neptune. You don't have to use a Neptune, you can use whatever you happen to have. And I think I'm going to start in by going in with some of the red trees just because it'll give me a nice, um, something that will really kind of stand out and be punchy. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going in and dabbing some of these uh, trees with vermilion. So that way I can kind of get that real bright color uh, out right off the bat so that it won't seem so shocking if I go in with some more brighter colors. 
And even though I, I do have a reference photo I'm going for, I do a lot of just kind of making it up as I go along, putting in colors where I think those colors ought to be. So it, I'm not necessarily following the reference photo perfectly. I'm using it more of like a color and uh, um, composition reference. I don't know where this picture was taken. It looks like it could be anywhere in New England, really. Try not to get too much water in your paint when you're mixing your greens so that you don't end up with uh, too weak of a color. I have this nice darker, um, thicker green I can go in and do some shadows with. Do my darker, like the under parts of the trees will be a lot darker because there's all kinds of shadow there, especially if you have a like, thick forest. And I don't want it straight at the bottom because I want there to be like, uh, look like there's kind of shrubbery in front. You can keep dabbing until you run out of paint. That will give you some fluctuations in color and make it look more realistic. You don't really want any white of the paper to show after your... Um, on this half anyway after you're done this uh, section. Can extend some up a little bit higher, especially these evergreens. Use the tip of the brush when you want detail, and just press more on the brush when you want a, um, a thicker line. I decided to bring this uh, evergreen in front instead of having it tucked in, and just a tip showing, because I thought it just gives a little more scale to the piece. I'm going to come over on the other side. I'm going to put in a little bit of that shadow and then I'm going to go into the brights because I already have it on my brush and I don't just want to rinse it away. That's the only reason I'm doing that. I'm just kind of tucking a little tree in behind. And then I'm going to go back in with my reds. Vermilion, and you'll notice that a lot of warm colors tend to be a little more opaque, like your cadmium colors, uh, and that's kind of, uh, you can use that to, their, to your advantage when you're going over um, and you're building the landscape because they will cover up a little bit of what's behind it, so you're not, um, you have a little bit more of like a, uh, the benefit like an acrylic painter might have with those certain colors, so you can kind of think, is this color warmer? Can I go over something? It might give you, help you to be able to save a painting. If it mixes in some of that green, it's just going to neutralize it, and that's fine for a landscape. And I want some of that um, permanent yellow deep. interest to those reds. It's pretty much just a dabbing motion.
You could even sponge if you wanted to. Um, actually, I got a sponge right here. We can try that. You can use uh, sea sponge. You can use cut up kitchen sponge, like the cellulose sponge, not the not the other kind. But those will work really well for getting some texture in there. Cutting or tearing a cellulose sponge will give you those really rough, natural edges. I usually like to pick up my lighter color, like a yellow, and then like kind of stamp it into a green. And then you can get some really nice textures. Now, is this still qualify as a watercolor? Because you are using sponge, but you're not using any other medium. Oh, totally. So yeah, it's totally. Technically... Yep. Yeah, it just matters what's on the paper when you're done. also a really great way to quickly fill in some areas. Just tap it on your palette, um, especially if you're going in with a like a dark color like a red so you don't end up with a blob unexpectedly so you can kind of control a little bit better. Okay, so we can put some branches in after that dries. We can get a few kind of lost and found branches, and that will help give a little structure to our form. And just to clean the brush, just dunk them in your water, rinse them out good. Um, if there's still paint that you can see, then you know take them to the sink and um, and wash them properly. So now I want to probably switch to a smaller brush. I want to do a little detail around the edge of the stream because it seems like it's fairly dry around there. I'm going to start with some burnt sienna. And the reason I'm switching to a uh, golden Teflon brush, like these Aqualons, is because they keep their spring um, when they are, even when they're fully loaded, they don't get they don't get soppy. They uh, they're gonna bounce right back as soon as you you know lift them up. So what I like to do is just kind of throw in a little bit of paint and then to kind of drag the color up. Sometimes you can put like a little bead of, of paint there and drag them up. You want your like the grasses to be bigger, closer to the front of the landscape because that will be closer to the viewer. Now I'm going to grab a little bit of burnt sienna into the, I'm sorry, uh, Prussian blue into the <clears throat> burnt sienna. And you can see it almost makes like a greenish, um, a greenish brown because the Prussian blue has so much of a green undertone to it. And I'm doing a layer of that kind of on top. <laughs> Something got dropped upstairs. I didn't hear a scream, so I don't think it was anything important. No. Didn't hear a scream or anybody blaming anybody, so no. it must be fine. <laughs> no names were uh, yelled out. Use your brush straight up and down and just kind of flick from the bottom of the paper when you get these bigger grasses in the front. I'm add some of mixed, mixed, my green that I mixed in there, too. The, uh, you do have to dip your brush and reload more frequently with a synthetic, with a regular synthetic, just because it's not going to be as absorbent. So, <clears throat> so just be prepared for that. If you're starting to get like broken lines, you feel like your brush is dragging, just reload. Okay. Get a little more yellowy green by taking some of that uh, warm yellow, that permanent yellow deep, adding it into my green and over a few more glasses over here. I'm going to 
going to do some yellow and some burnt sienna. So I'm not using yellow ochre, so I'm going to kind of fake it a little bit here. This nice golden color, which will be much more transparent than yellow ochre. Kind of like a raw sienna. But don't be afraid to mix new colors. Uh, now I'm going to do some grasses and some red over here. And then I'm going to grab some burnt sienna. Right with the red, so it's just going to darken it a little bit. And then I'm going to grab that yellow that we just mixed, the yellow and the burnt sienna. I'm going to go back to the number eight and I'm going to soften some of that. I want a little more green down here at the base of this tree line. So I just picked up one of my mixed that uh, it was the Prussian blue and a permanent yellow deep. I'm just kind of giving a little bit of shadow under the tree line there. Break apart uh, some of the bushes and trees. And I think I want to intensify the blue in the water a bit, so I'm going to grab some of the uh, blue, some of the Prussian blue, and quite a bit of water. You want it pretty, uh, you want your brush to be loaded right up, and you want it pretty, um, pretty juicy. It's a real strong color. Sometimes you don't know how dark you want something to be until you have painted your other elements it can they it would just feel too dark otherwise so I'm just going in and glazing that in I'm glazing right over those grasses since they were made with fresh and blue I can go right over them and it doesn't look too weird and it's not really um, lifting them either because I'm just using a very soft brush and then I'm going to grab some of those colors that I had used in the uh, the the grass right around there and I'm going to throw those in as well. The reflection should match up. Oh, I hear some, uh, some keyboard happening upstairs. So we got some musical background. House band, everybody. <laughs> Wire house band. Woo! <laughs> Uh, Delilah, what is the most common or biggest mistake you often see when it comes to glazing and how to fix it? Huh, I would say using too stiff of a brush um, so it streaks what's underneath or not waiting long enough for the uh, colors underneath to dry so it lifts. Probably impatience and not leaving enough time for it to dry. Um, also, like working with student grade paints when you're trying to glaze can be very um, it's not really a mistake because, you know, you're not technically technically doing anything wrong, but often um, the student grade paints will be very difficult to glaze with because they just don't have the transparency and the strength. I want this little tuft of land to be broken apart from the grasses behind it, so I'm just going in a little bit of this color. But just like anything, it's it's practice. It's all practice. And I want to separate this chunk of trees from this background there, so I'm going into this cooler green. Uh, Alex, Sarah, I may have missed it, but how do you feel about the golden colors you purchased? How is the color selection? 
the color selection is good. There are um, quite a few mixed colors in that um, in that collection um, that I bought. Uh, that said, I mean they're nice and bright and good quality. I would have preferred them if they. I would have preferred if they picked more single pigment colors versus all the mixes. But it was also extremely inexpensive. I mean it's like about two bucks a tube. So you know for that price, I kind of expect they have to make some sort of you know considerations. Um, and they, I mean, these are the these are the colors I squeezed out last summer when I first got them, and I didn't put a lot in, and I'm still working on that. And I took this with me and taught a class, and one of my students used this palette for a few days. So, you know, a little goes a long way. They're extremely um, wonderful, high quality paints. I just wish they didn't have so many mixed pigments in that set. But that said, I mean, if I didn't know it was mixed pigment, I probably wouldn't know it was mixed pigment, you know, because they're so transparent and bright. So I would just, I would definitely give them a try. Um, or you can always buy some individually if you absolutely do not want mixed pigments. But um, I think it's a great way to try out the line without spending a ton of money. Uh, Leah G, what is your biggest tip for painting watercolor landscapes? My biggest tip would be to go do some plain air painting because you're going to um, observe the world a lot differently and a lot more, you're just going to notice a lot more things if you're out in the, in the landscape painting versus painting photographs. And it's really fun. Your paintings probably won't be as good at painting out in the world just because you know you're you've got to deal with changing light and things like that. But I think it's really worthwhile because um, you just you just observe so much differently once you're really in there. You're having that experience of being in the area you're painting and I think it's really worthwhile. That's my favorite way to do landscapes. I typically don't paint many landscapes unless I am painting in plain air. I'm going to make a branch color. I'm going to go with burnt sienna and Russian blue. And since it is a little green, I'm going to grab a little of that vermilion red to warm it up. So I get a nice neutral brown. Getting the brown kind of like that. So it's um, burnt sienna, Prussian blue, vermilion. And I am just going to use my brush straight up and down and fill in a few little lost and found branches. And by lost and found, I just mean that you're not seeing the entire branch because you wouldn't. You, there'd be some leaves in front. Uh, crossover Magic X or Crossover Magic 11. Uh, how do I manage with a limited palette? I have a small sample pack of watercolors, and I don't want to waste them. Well, we're only using um, five colors today. I, I said four, but then I realized I forgot burnt sienna. Um, you just mix. You know, make a chart. Make a, like, if you have, um, if you've got five colors, make a, make a chart where you go, like, you've got, you know, five rows and five columns. I know this is, you do this part with a pencil. But then you would, you know, list out all your colors this way and that way, and then you would mix them together where they meet up on the chart. If you just Google how to make a watercolor chart, you'll find all kinds of, um, of examples. Um, and that way you can see all the combinations that are available with your paint. And it may feel like you're wasting because you're, like, making this chart. It's really not. You're going to uh, benefit from, um, from doing that quite a bit. So that's what I would recommend. And you're probably going to come up with a lot more um, a lot more combinations than you think you will. I'm using a liner here. That's when you have long, skinny bristles. And I'm soaking up as much of that same uh, branch brown color. And I'm just going to flick in some grasses. So I have these really fine grasses on top of the other ones that I've already painted. Uh, Rosin Rose Art, have you tried the new Windsor and Newton watercolor paper? If so, what do you think? I haven't tried the new stuff, but they had they had artist watercolor paper out you know, 20 years ago, and I used that, and it's wonderful. I can't imagine it's that much different. It's 100% cotton, and the new stuff says 100% cotton. Um, somebody had said they had gone away from using 100% cotton for a while, uh, so maybe this is just a reboot of their original watercolor paper. I'm not sure. This is just burnt sienna. I just wanted to see what it was going to do on this damp area of the paper. I'm 
going back to the number eight round. And I'm going to mix up some nice dark green. So I'm going to do the Prussian blue. I'm going to grab some of that vermilion. I'll move my palette over so you can see. Just grab some vermilion off the palette. I'll just grab a little bit off the wells too. That's almost going to make me a black. I'm going to grab a little bit of, uh, maybe I'll try lemon this time. There we go. So you can see that lemon is more opaque usually than, um, which is weird because lemon's a cooler color, but lemon does tend to be a little more opaque. Must be that the, uh, mineral that's in it. And I'm going to use that to kind of redefine some of the edges of any foreground trees that I have. Uh, Artu Pavola, have you tried the Holbin gouache? I haven't, but I ter I've heard it's pretty good. I've heard it's one of the few light fast gouaches out there, but no, I haven't personally tried it. So anytime I'm over here, I'm kind of looking at their places where I can have like a dark green trees poking through um, these darker colored ones, uh, these uh, orange ones, just to kind of give me a little bit of interest because it looks pretty blobby over here. And I need a darker green for um, for some shadows, so I'm going to go grab a little more Prussian blue and add that to the mix, and it's going to make me a really nice dark color that's nice and transparent. It's very inky, and I can go in and get some really nice dark shadows. So I want to have some dark shadows under this mass of trees here. So what I'm doing is redefining the top edges of any grasses or shrubs that are in there and bringing it over to this big tree. And then I'm just gonna kind of dab parts up, upward so I just get these kind of like just masses of shadow. Uh, Claire Simmons, do you have any tips for shading? I always find myself messing up in my paintings or drawings when I try to shade. Um, I would say really observe, go with a reference photo and or an actual object. Um, to paint from and really observe where the light is hitting it. Try to set a fixed light source like a lamp instead of going by daylight because if you're taking a long time to paint the, the light's going to change on you and then you're going to end up with um, confusing shadows because you're not going to know which ones are true and which ones are false because the light changes. So that would be my advice. And yeah, some shadow underneath this tree so I'm going in the same color. I'm going to pull some shadow in from the sides there, too, to show there might be some more trees there. And this side, oh, we should have more shadow under here, too. So I'm just adding the shadow at the bottom of these grasses here on the edge. I'm just going to flick them up a little bit. And if you use that brush straight on its tip, you will be able to get um, the fine lines. All right, I'm going to warm up that shadow color with a little bit of burnt sienna. So I just added burnt sienna to that dark green. And I am going to throw some of that over here and pick up some more grasses. I want it warm over here because the light is hitting more over here, but we still need some shadows. And I'm going to grab a little more yellowy green just to darken this up a little bit back here because it still is, wants to be part of this big blob and I want that a little separate. A little more burnt sienna in the bottom of the water over here. Bottom of the grass is touching the water, I should say. Muddy banks. 
And I'm feeling like the water still could use a little bit more blue. Um, there's quite a shift from wet to dry with the Prussian blue. It's not a color I use all that often. Um, so I'm not as familiar with it. It looks so bright going on, but it does fade quite a bit. So I'm going to just pump up the color a little bit in here. With a bigger brush, it's not covering too much. <laughs> Breathe them in sawdust, probably. Probably, too. We brought something with her. All right. I think I'm going to dry this and kind of figure out what else it needs. But I think we're almost done. We've got a pretty good uh, layer of paint all over everything. So if you think of any questions uh, while I'm drying, just make sure to type the word question in all caps. And then you can type your question with regular letters, regular lowercase letters. And uh, we'll answer it for you. Uh, Archie Pavola, what would you say are the best tips for clean air painting? Um, pack lights. Make sure you bring uh, water for yourself and to paint with. Um, and wear sunscreen and a sun hat so that you're not uncomfortable. Because if you don't have uh, like a sun hat shield in your face, it's going to be very difficult to stay out for very long. I think I want to do a little sponging in here because I feel like this needs a little texture. I'm going to grab sea sponge and some vermilion, which is our warm red. Tap it on my palette a little bit to get some of the excess off. And then I'm just going to go and kind of tap here and there. Take it right off the top of the paper. Uh, Lady Davila. How come Lindsay is not getting blues in the water? She put on some blue a few minutes ago and just added more. It didn't seem there was enough time to dry. Um, though I think it was dry underneath. Otherwise, it would have bloomed. I almost have a bloom right there because the uh, water, like on that next to the last layer, the the uh, bank was a little wet. Also, on rough paper, you're not going to get as many blooms as you would like on a hot press paper. Shauna Gayton, how do you do you find that yellow ochre gets muddy when used wet on wet? How do you combat? Um, well, you have to, I wouldn't, you just got to be careful how many other warm colors you're using with it. Warm colors tend to make muddy mixes together. Um, so, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. Using a yellow ochre with a phthalo blue will give you a clean mix, but it might mud up with a yellow ochre, uh, with that ultramarine blue, it'll mud up and give you a little bit more of like a grayish olive color. So, just make sure you're not using too many warm colors and you shouldn't end up with too much mud. Um, and then I think the only other things I want to add are maybe a few distinct branches. And I'm just going to grab my burnt sienna, a little bit of fresh and blue, a little bit of the red here to get rid of the green because uh, Prussian is very green based. And I'm going to throw in, let me show this nice and dry. I think. Yeah, that feels dry. I'm going to throw in just kind of a few, a few branches here in the foreground to really give it kind of focal point. There's some, looks like little um, branches with teeny tiny little leaves on it. So I'm just going to dab in some, some leaves. Because everything got kind of like flat, so by if you add something foreground like this, it'll give you a little bit more um, dimension, a little more perspective. Uh, Candy Kelly, when painting large bodies of water, should the water furthest away be lighter than the water that is closest to you? You know, it really depends on the time of day and the lighting. I would look, uh, either go from real life or get some reference photos. So that you can see, like at the time of day you're painting, what the water looks like. Would what type of water? Like if it's smooth water, would that affect? Or yeah, is that a mostly lot. Light. 
yeah, rip, any water with any ripples is going to be kind of a crapshoot because depending on how the water, the waves are coming in and how the water's hitting it, and if it's a sunset, I mean, there's a lot of different variables. So I would definitely recommend that you get some reference photos and and uh, observe because there's no there's no hard and fast rule. Like when you're looking at the sky, you're, it's always lighter towards the horizon line, but that's not always. But then if you have a sunset, it's going to be a little different. And I mean, there's just too many variables to say for sure. I'm going to throw a few of those little branches in over here too because I kind of like the way that looked and I think it will frame the piece a little bit nice, nicer. You could do cattails too if you want. I feel like I do too many cattails though. It's kind of my, my feel safe. Uh, Tiffany Gray, are there any specialty brushes that are must-haves other than basic round brushes? Depends on what you paint. If you do a lot of like um, animals or portraits, you might want a rake or fan brush or comb brush to do like the individual hairs. A deerfoot stippler, if you do a lot of uh, landscapes, is handy for foliage. Um, it really, really depends on what you like to paint. A good resource for specialty brushes would be um, like a decorative artist store. They, they, have a, they have a brush for everything, so you can even sometimes see them in action and then decide if it would you know, add value to your paintings. I'm just going in there trying to break that apart a little bit. Ashton Mack, how do you distinguish the light in different times of day? Like afternoon is golden light, but twilight is a blue light. Um, well, it sounds like you've distinguished it. Maybe he means like color like mixing color or something um uh maybe well if you're mixing like twilight colors you definitely want cooler colors if you're doing like the afternoon early morning or, or late afternoon the golden hours you definitely want warmer mixes like you would you want to mix yellow ochre in with things because it would just give you that kind of sweet warm light um so yeah, it's like looking at warms and cools. So if you need, if you're trying to mix colors and keep it in a cooler look, you'd want like more of a magenta as opposed to a vermilion red. You'd want, um, you know, your cooler blues. You want your cooler greens and everything. So um, yeah, I think it would just depend. Just make sure you're picking the cooler or the warm versions of your colors to get the colors that you're after. All right, I'm going to call this done. It's a pretty simple landscape, five colors, good for beginners. I'm going to amend the video description and write burnt sienna in there. So um, those watching the replay, I'm going to just go ahead and add it to my little swatch here just so I don't forget to to say it. But um, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you played kind of along. I think it's a good one for a beginner to try. And I guess that's it. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you guys for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this tutorial. And... Um, We'll see you later. Bye.